my distinct pleasure today to um, uh, welcome uh, Maria Clave. She's the uh, president of uh, Harvey Mudd College. Uh, she'll be talking on increasing diversity in the STEM uh, workforce, as you see here. Uh, she began uh, her tenure at Harvey Mudd College in 2006 as the fifth president. Um, and I'm proud to say that I've actually known just about all of them uh, because uh, in a fit of absolute bias, I graduated from Harvey Mudd College years ago. So I'm just simply thrilled to have uh, my alma mater's president uh, here today. Um, Harvey Mudd is a very, very small school, science and engineering uh, oriented. And uh, it's, uh, it's also a special place uh, in terms of not only its dedication to science and engineering, but also to uh, sort of personal growth, uh, teamwork, organization, some of these softer values, if you will, while not uh, stinting on the fact that physical chemistry and quantum mechanics will, will break you uh, eventually. Um, <laughs> But uh, Maria has uh, served at, uh, at Princeton University, uh, the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, uh, University of British Columbia, a fine academic career. I can uh, look at her bio. Uh, she herself, in her own research, has made significant contributions in mathematics and computer science. And uh, she's one of uh, 10 members of the board of uh, Microsoft Corporation, board member of Broadcom, nonprofit Math for America, and, and so on and so forth. She's elected as a fellow of the Association of Computing Machinery in 1996 and a founding fellow of the Canadian Information Processing Society in 2006. Uh, and so it's particularly appropriate for uh, this lecture, lecture uh, annual in honor of Alan Bromley, a former presidential science advisor who also was from Canada. Um, a, on another fit of bias, I'm pleased to say that uh, Maria herself is originally from Canada and uh, so I thought was also particularly uh, well suited uh, to being our speaker this, uh, this year. Um, Wonderful person, and a very interesting talk, and I turn it over to Maria. Thanks, Scott. I've um, given talks a number of times here, and, um, but not in this particular center. Um, I'm gonna talk about increasing diversity in the STEM workforce, as you can see. And I'm gonna start by saying a little bit about who's underrepresented where, and I'll talk about also why it matters that there are underrepresented groups. Um, I'll talk about the reasons, and I'll talk a bit about uh, increasing participation. I promise the most fun will come when I tell you about the imposter panel. And I will close with talking about how the faculty at Harvey Mudd College uh, managed to significantly increase the number of women majoring in computer science there and then we'll have some time for questions and answers. So, who's un underrepresented where for undergraduate degrees? Well, if we're looking at women, um, they're particularly underrepresented in computer science uh, at PhD granting institutions for the last five years. They'd be between 11 and 14% of the uh, recipients of bachelor's degrees in computer science. Um, what's interesting is it's the only field of science or engineering where participation by women has declined over the last 30 years. In 1980, they were roughly 30 to 35 percent of the recipients of bachelor's degrees, so um, that's quite a steep decline. Um, they have been steady at about 20 percent or 22 percent of the recipients of bachelor's degrees in physics for quite a while, and similarly for engineering. Though I will say in engineering, um, it varies very widely depending on the field of engineering. Bioengineering is about 50% female, chem chemical engineering about 40%, and civil and environmental a little bit less than that. The areas where there are very few women, aerospace, um, computer engineering, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering. Now, one of the things I, I'm focusing on this is because I use the word STEM science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And, you know, we hear a lot about the need for more people getting STEM degrees. But, you know, the reality is we absolutely do not need more chemists and biologists. There aren't enough jobs for chemists and biologists. We probably actually don't need more physicists, though physicists managed to make a pretty good transition into both finance and computer science because they have so much mathematics. And, and of course, where are the women overrepresented in STEM? In biology and chemistry, more than 50%, a good 
bit more than 50% of the undergraduate degrees go to women in those fields. So it's important to pay attention to, um, to think about more specifically where underrepresented groups are or, and are not, in which areas, but also where there's demand. And um, anyone want to guess what area of STEM there's the highest demand for right now? Not aerospace, nope. Okay, computer science. It's amazing the demand for computer science right now. And, um, you know, a lot of people have said, is this just the bubble again? I mean, a bachelor's degree from Harvey Mudd College in computer science gets you a starting salary of $90,000 plus. We had, um, I think, 15 students last year out of roughly 185 that graduated that had got a starting salary of over $100,000. The highest starting salary I've seen so far in the last few years is $285,000 um, for a graduate from Harvey Mudd College. So, um, you know, it's well worth knowing and thinking about where the demand is. Okay, who else is underrepresented? Well, African Americans are underrepresented in every single area of science and engineering. So are Hispanics. So are Native Americans, so are LGBT, and so are poets, football players, actors. <laughs> okay, so the real point I'm trying to make here is it's not just people of color and women who are underrepresented. There is a particular kind of culture in science and engineering that makes it much more comfortable for the people who are like the people who have been scientists and engineers for the last 50 or 100 years. So one of the things that's really interesting is there are a ton of scientists and engineers who are musicians, classical musicians, right? It's really common. It is not a black mark on you to be a classical musician, a very ta talented pianist or violinist or whatever. But being an artist is flaky. And this just tells you that there haven't been a lot of, there's been a lot of visibility of scientists and engineers who are musicians, classical musicians, and not a lot of visibility of people who are artists or poets. So uh, if you look at um, full professors and senior positions in industry, all of those groups are going to be underrepresented, which is, of course, not surprising for most of those groups since they're underrepresented already at the undergraduate level. But what's really interesting is that even for areas like biology and chemistry, where the percentage of PhDs is, that's going to females in those areas for quite a while has been up around or over 40%, there are tiny numbers of full professors in the most prestigious institutions. So, you know, the, one of the things is that even when you get um, more underrepresented groups moving up the pipeline from undergraduate through graduate degrees and into assistant professor positions, it's still you see a big drop off as people move into more senior positions. And you know, part of that is that women and underrepresented minorities are twice as likely to leave tech careers in the first 10 years. And it's not because they're not doing well, okay? So let me talk about why it matters before I talk about the reasons for underrepresentation. Um, well, the first thing is uh, we can talk about the future of the world. And uh, there are two ways in which it matters to the future of the world. The first one is there are certain areas where we really have a shortage. I mentioned computer science. It's not the only one. It's the biggest one right now. But, you know, if you talk to the tech companies, they're going nuts because they can't get enough H-1B visas because they claim, and I, from my experience with both Microsoft and Broadcom, it seems to be really true, that there just aren't enough qualified software engineers for them to hire from within this country. And if, you know, more than 50% of our population is not interested and is not entering those fields, 
it's ridiculous because this country really needs more people in that area. So that's one reason. But the second reason, which is actually probably the most important from my perspective is, if you have a group of people who all have similar perspectives and they're find, trying to find a solution to a problem, they will not find the best solutions because they're gonna be bringing the same mindset, the same set of ideas to address that problem. But if you have a group of people who are genuinely have lots of different experiences and perspectives and you know, come from different cultures and different gender, different race, you're gonna get much better answers because what's gonna happen is you're gonna have these different perspectives playing against each other and it's cause, gonna cause everyone to be more creative and to have more ideas. And I certainly live that way in my own life. I have six vice presidents at Harvey Mudd College and, um, and also the director of the president's office and we make up what's called, quote unquote, the cabinet. It sounds really important. But really this is the group that stop me, stops me from making terrible mistakes. Because I don't make a decision about anything without us discussing it as a group. And the most important thing that people on that team can do is disagree with me and disagree with each other. Because that's how we actually see the different sides of decisions. And it's how we say, well, we were gonna do that. That doesn't sound like a very good idea now. How can we modify that so it's gonna address the different issues that have been raised by other people? The final reason why it matters is in general, STEM careers, if you can actually get a job, and I have a reason to say that that I'll mention in a moment, are really fabulous. They offer an opportunity to make a big difference in the world. They, in general, because you tend to be evaluated for what you achieve rather than the number of hours you spend doing something, they offer a good, good opportunities for combining uh, family life, personal life, and work life. Uh, they certainly these days offer a lot of opportunities for travel. And uh, the reason I said if you can get a job is I finished my PhD in mathematics in 1977. I applied for every job that was advertised in North America at the time. There were 83. Most of them were at institutions, and I don't mean tenure track jobs, there are 83 jobs of any description for somebody with a PhD in pure mathematics. So I have applied to the University of Kentucky at Bowling Green, is that really the name of it? I have applied to so many universities you've never heard of. And I got one lecturer offer and I got one tenure track offer. And I took the tenure track offer because um, my advisor said, you're really lucky to get a tenure track offer as a faculty member. And I, I took it and I just hated the place that I ended up at. Um, the students were not very strong but I hated it mostly because I was single and there were no single people. I had one date in eight months. It was a person who I knew was a jerk before I went out with them. <laughs> this is, you know, like how lonely I was. So the way I coped with all this loneliness was I went to um, a conference every month. And part of going to those conferences was I found out that there were people who I knew as mathematicians who actually worked in computer science departments. And I also found out from talking to these people that there were so many jobs for people with computer science PhDs. And I'm going like, wow. And I went, you know, the world is not a fair place. I solved three 20-year-old problems in my PhD thesis in my field. And you're telling me these people aren't that good and they're getting an offer from Harvard and MIT and Bell Labs? And the person who I said this to, he said, life is not fair. Just go back and get a second PhD in computer science. <laughs> so I said, fine. And I said, where would be the best places? I mean, the area I should work in is theoretical computer science because it's right at the interface between math and, and computer science. I said, where should I apply? And he says, oh, top three departments in, are Stanford, MIT, and the University of Toronto. And he gave me a name of a faculty member and their phone number because this is before email, to phone at each place. And I phoned, and Stanford, they said, Meh, we closed, this is March 15th, 1978. I, Stanford person says, applications closed January 15th for a PhD program. You have to wait a year. Uh, MIT person says, 
uh, you sound great, but we only have funding for five and a half PhD students in theoretical computer science. This, this is a joke if you know MIT now, how big it is in theoretical computer science. But, and, and we have 11 students already, so we couldn't fund you. And I called the guy at the University of Toronto and he said, oh, you're Canadian. Now the reason it was important that I was Canadian was that the province of Ontario government had just that year put in a restriction that they couldn't use the Ontario graduate scholarships for anyone other than Canadians. And most of their graduate students at that point came from the US and so they were really hard up for Canadian graduate students. So anyway, I went there, um, I decided I'd do all my uh, graduate work in the first year and then I would do my research in the second year and I'd be done. Well, three months into my graduate work, I was getting requests to apply for faculty positions in computer science. I went for my first interview, came back, there was a message to call the head of the uh, department at Toronto and I thought, oops, I'm in trouble. And he says, um, when I call, he says, we have jobs here, why aren't you applying here? And I said, because you're a really good department. And he said, there better be an application on my desk by nine o'clock on Monday morning. And they hired me. So I never finished that second PhD. So the point of the story is, <laughs> the point of the story is, and it's, you know, it's, it's important when you're thinking about what you want to do with your life if you are in the STEM fields, to think about where there's need as well as what your passion is. Because you can usually map them onto each other. Though you do have to be willing to learn some new things. But we all know that, right? I mean, we know that we're in this, this is a century where we will have many different careers and work in many different areas throughout our life. And that has certainly been the case for me. So, why don't we have lots of women in some areas and African Americans and Hispanics and Native Americans and poets and others? It's really easy. For the most part, it's lack of interest. Though I will say that particularly for students in low income families, it's not always lack of interest. It may also be lack of access to gatekeeper, good gatekeeper courses like mathematics and physics and so on in high school. It's perceived lack of ability. And that perceived lack of ability can be for lots of different reasons and you know one of the things I just want to say straight out is every single one of us carries unconscious bias that underestimates the ability of people who don't look like the norm. So um, if you are a female in math or CS or physics or whatever, people are not just not going to expect you to be really great. They just won't. And it's not because they're meaning to discriminate against you. It's just the great computer scientists, mathematicians, and physicists that they've interact with have been, to a very large extent, male. And that kind of bias is held by virtually everyone. And you know, there are things we can do about it. Uh, we can learn to train ourselves to think about it. But it's definitely there. There's occasionally explicit bias, I mean deliberate bias. So I cannot tell you how many times um, I have had somebody tell me, I, I don't think you're really any good. You only got that job because you're female. And I've been the first female in my job for 25 years. And you know, I mean, there's a lot of particularly older men, I'm getting sort of old myself now, but you know, men who were a lot older than me at the time who would say those kinds of things? And um, I'm very sorry to say that it still happens today. So Harvey Mudd College, as I'll talk about in a little bit, we have dramatically increased the number of female students in the last 15 years. So uh, a lot of effort by the former president, John Strauss, and then it's continued uh, while I've been president. And we, for the last several years, we've been admitting 50-50 female and male. And there is no difference in terms of the SAT scores or the AP scores or the GPA or whatever you want to look at for the female and male students we admit. And we were coming in around 40% female because those same women are being admitted to Caltech and Stanford and MIT. And we were have just not being as successful as they were in recruiting them because they're better known than we are. 
And then one year, we got 51.5% female. And the year before, it had been 40% female. We had not changed anything about, actually anything. I mean, we're a very small place. We have 750 students. So small numbers can result in large variation. The entire place went nuts. Students and faculty were saying, you must have changed the standards. You couldn't possibly be more than 50% female if you hadn't lowered the st standards. And that particular class, unfortunately, was carrying the stereotype threat as they went through their first year at MUD because everybody was saying, you only got in because you were female. You only get, got in because you were female. You and you and you. And um, we were very, we've been very relieved that in fact we've been under 50% for the next few years because we think it's not fair to the female students to put them through that. But you know, Harvey Mudd is full of wonderful students and faculty and staff. It's not that people are bad people, it is that change is hard. And then, in addition, underrepresented groups tend to have the imposter syndrome to a greater degree than the majority groups. And I'll talk about that in a moment, but I'll just ask you, how many people know what the imposter syndrome is? Okay, so about half. Um, and then the other thing is that even if you've decided that you're gonna major in physics or aerospace or computer science, but you're a very small minority, you often have the sense of just not belonging. And the way I like to describe this is, um, one point I, I was meeting a couple of alumni who graduated, I think a little bit before I arrived, and they were male and they were computer science majors, and I just happened to ask them, how many women were there in your year? And one of them said, oh, just one. And there would typically be 25 to 30 majors graduating each year. And the other one said, no, no, there was that other person, and named a name. And the first person said, no, no, she wasn't a computer science major. Yeah, I mean, I know she was, but she didn't hang out with us and do all the stuff we did. So the definition from their point of view about, it wasn't just about being signed up for it, it was about reading the same blogs, it was about playing the same video games, it was about playing uh, live role-playing games at midnight in the basements. <laughs> Those of you who are mutters know what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, and all of these things result in lower persistence in the face of difficulty. So it's a, it's a very interesting book written by Jane Margolis and Alan Fisher about uh, work done in the mid-1990s at Carnegie Mellon University, uh, studying why their percentage of women majoring in computer science was so low. It's called um, Unlocking the Clubhouse. And um, they went from roughly 7% female in their major to um, in the mid-30s over a, a number of years by addressing a number of the factors that they found. But one of the things that they identified that was extremely interesting was they interviewed all the women who chose to leave, who signed up to major in computer science, but chose to leave. And they were not leaving because they were doing badly. They were leaving because the first time they got a B plus instead of an A, that confirmed for them that they didn't belong. So they're much more likely, whereas there are males who are getting Cs, they also interviewed males who saying, I rule, I rock, you know? <laughs> so. Okay, if those are the issues, and, and I have skipped a major area because I have skipped the whole issue about people in low-income neighborhoods in the United States where most of the teaching in math and science in high school, I, well, just most of the education in math and science in high school and, and prior to high school is really weak. And I'm not gonna address that. It's a much bigger problem than what I'm talking about today. And it is something that I'm working on in other contexts, but not one that this talk is gonna address. We could still fix a lot if we could increase interest, increase confidence, increase sense of belonging, and increase persistence. So um, increasing interest in STEM careers. One of the things that we know about certainly about females and to a lesser extent, but for the research that we do have supports it, is that in general, 
underrepresented groups are more motivated by applications than just by the abstract issues in a field. Of course there are exceptions to this. I'm, for instance, I'm started in pure mathematician and I'm female, but um, we know that um, team competitions and prizes actually motivate people. Um, there's been a lot of work to try and portray much more diverse role models. And for instance, uh, Engineer Your Life is one for engineering. Diva is one for women in computer science. And um, just giving our students uh, in high school more information about the job opportunities um, by major, I think, is a really good idea. And one of the things that really bugs me is that um, if you look at most of the biology students, biology majors, biochemistry majors in, in large research universities, they think they're going to go to med school. The vast majority of them won't. And the vast majority of them won't find a job working in the biotech industry or doing anything else that will actually use their education. So I, I do realize that in the United States, we like to talk about just doing education for the sake of ed education and, you know, there shouldn't be a connection with what you major in at, as an undergraduate and what you do as your career. But I can tell you that most of the most effective programs in getting underrepresented minorities to go to four-year institutions and get a bachelor's degree are because people have been able to connect for them the connection between doing that and actually getting a good job after you graduate. So, increasing confidence. Um, I think it's very important for all of us to l learn how, learn about unconscious bias, to accept that we all have it, and to figure out how to compensate. And there's a great website if you Bing or Google, I have to say Bing, but actually I use Bing all the time. Uh, Project Implicit, uh, you'll see what I'm talking about. Providing access to role models and mentors um, encouragement is incredibly important, but it's not enough just to encourage. If I say to Heather, Heather, you are going to be incredibly successful, but if I don't actually say to Heather before I say that, what you've taken on is really challenging, and you're going to have to work really hard, and you're have to, going to have to overcome difficulty, but I know you can succeed. If I point out that it's hard, but you can succeed, it's much more effective in terms of encouraging people than just randomly encouraging. And then um, one of the, I think, most fun things that uh, has been thought of, and it was thought of by what my, uh, somebody who's now a senior researcher at Microsoft, but who was my first PhD student, um, is to host an imposter panel with some successful folks who are underrepresented in their field. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit uh, no, I'm not. Now I'm going to talk about increasing the sense of belonging, and then I'll come to the imposter panel. Um, so how do you increase the se sense of belonging? Well, one thing is, is to actually have people who are a small minority in their discipline have the experience of being the vast majority. So um, in computer science, there's a conference, an annual conference each year. Uh, it's going to be October 2nd through 5th in Minneapolis this year, of where uh, there are roughly 3,000 female computer scientists and other technologists from everything from high school students right up to some of the most senior women in the field. And then there's about 50 or 75 men. Now those men are to they're mostly deans or department chairs or technology executives who are there because they want to understand what the, that reverse experience is. It's an amazing experience. It is joyful. It is exuberant. Uh, the Tapia Conference does the same thing for underrepresented minorities, for engineering. There are, are similar kinds of conferences. Most tech companies now run an annual conference for women because women are so underrepresented. And many of them also do things for uh, technical employees of color. It's really important that everything that an engineering school or a science department shows about their institution has people from underrepresented groups. And I cannot tell you, as Dean of Engineering at Princeton, as Dean of Engineering anywhere, you get sent a magazine from every engineering school in the country. 
And I'm, I'm afflicted with this need to count, which means I'll flick through and I'll count how many female photos I'll see. And, and it's not unusual to see hundreds of males and a handful of females, I, let alone looking for students of color. Um, really thinking about how you present yourself makes a big difference. It's important to let students know that scientists and engineers, they do other things as well. They can compete in triathlons. They can be ballroom dancers. One of the most amazing things at MUD is that a significant chunk of our students are on the Claremont ballroom dancing troupe that is, I mean, who knew? But um, it competes nationally at one last year. Um, if, if you want access to sort of show your students, there's this great website that uh, WGBH has called The Secret Lives of Scientists and Engineers that's put together by the NOVA program. And um, the whole idea is they pick scientists and engineers who do other things in their life. So for I happen to be one of the ones they did in March. What were my secret things? I'm an artist and I ride a skateboard. Well, actually, it's a long board technically, but still. Um, and you know, one of the things about, uh, it's also a great thing to allow students who are from underrepresented groups to tutor middle school or high school students in math and science host outreach events because one of the things that really helps underrepresented groups feel a sense of belonging, if they feel there's something they can do with their knowledge that actually makes a difference. Okay, now the imposter panel. So I got a phone call from um, my PhD student, Corey, who's you know had her PhD for whatever it is now, more than 15 years. And she goes, Maria, wouldn't it be great if we could have a panel at the Hopper Conference where we had like five women that people thought were really successful at different stages in their career and they all confessed to being an imposter. I said, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's round up three other people and we'll do it. So each one of us made uh, a, a set of slides. I'm showing you the ones that, that they're being updated since we first did this. We did it in 2010. Um, so I was the presidential imposter and the first slide shows your career. It doesn't really matter what's on your career, um, but you know, to other people it looks impressive. All right, now they, what's the imposter syndrome? Let me start by saying what it is for those of you who haven't heard of it. Um, the imposter syndrome is this feeling that even though most people would think you're really pretty successful, you constantly have this feeling that you're not nearly as successful and not doing nearly as well as most people think you are. So I, the way I talk about it is that virtually every morning, not absolutely every morning, but I would say 95% of the morning, so 19 out of 20 mornings, I wake up and there is this voice on the side of my head that is saying, I am a failure. I just am a failure. I fail at everything. Then pretty much every day, probably 19 days out of 20, I also, or I have, a voice on the other side of my head that says, I can change the world. Okay, so I'm a failure and I can change the world. They make no sense. It's totally irrational. But I still have that feeling. So, and it's not unusual to have that feeling, but it seems particularly overrepresented among people who are underrepresented in their fields. So, the next slide says what you, I feel like an imposter when I, and for me, it's when I start doing something new that is something that successful people do and something that women don't often do. And I already mentioned that I'm the first female in my job for the last 25 years, so maybe it's not so surprising that I feel like an imposter. And then the next slide says, I have felt like an imposter when? And for me, it was useful to sort of lay it out according to the t a timeline of my life. So my parents were wonderful. They were academics. They gave us a very supportive, uh, incredibly supportive of academic achievement of education of learning. And particular of me, uh, encouraged me in science and math. But they didn't have a lot of money. Four daughters, so we didn't stay in hotels a lot. 
fact, I'm not sure we ever actually stayed in a hotel the whole time I lived with my parents. And we didn't eat in restaurants. We certainly didn't drive in taxis. So, you know, when, as part of my career, I started having to do these things, I felt extraordinarily um, uncomfortable doing them. And in particular, getting into a taxi, getting into a car with a stranger who might drive you anywhere. I mean, that just seemed insane. Now, you know, I'm, I'm happy to say, you know, I, I can get into taxis now. I'm perfectly fine with it. But um, as my career went on, there started being things that, you know, I, I started obviously doing things that I hadn't done before. And um, I'll just tell you, writing up the elevator to the first Microsoft board meeting. So I'm the first academic to still run the board of Microsoft. I'm one of two females. Um, I was going like, oh, they're going to just laugh me out of this room. It actually sort of was sort of that bad in some ways because um, one of the members, a very well-known uh, co-founder of Microsoft, uh, has this habit of when you say something that he doesn't agree with of going, that's the stupidest effing thing I've ever heard of. Are you trying to destroy the company? Only he doesn't say effing. He says the other word. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, you know, I, and then the final slide uh, for, for the imposter panel is tips for success. I mean, how you cope with it. So for me, of course, once you do something, once you've been in a taxi, let's say a thousand times, it's not scary. I mean, so practice is a really big part of it. Accepting self-doubt as part of who I am. I mean, I've just learned that this voice on this side of my head I just ignore it. I mean, it bothers me, but so long as it doesn't let me stop trying to do something that's important, it's fine. I surround myself with support. I have extraordinary, I have an extraordinary husband. Uh, I had parents who were very supportive. I have sisters who are supportive, kids who are supportive. And, and of course, I have amazing peers who are wonderful. And then, of course, it really helps to remember how scared I was of riding in taxis when I'm scared of something today. I mean, I admit being scared of riding in taxis was sort of silly, but. Okay, so my whole point about this is probably the majority of people in this room cope with feeling like an imposter from time to time. I'll just ask, raise your hand if you feel comfortable admitting it. Yeah, thank you. Um, and one of the reasons that doing this imposter panel is important is, I mean, one of the things I know for students is, we talk about this every time at the beginning of the school year at MUD with our first year students. Because I know there's gonna be a ton of students in that first semester that go, I'm not as smart as everybody else here. I'm really having trouble. I don't belong. They made a mistake when they admitted me. And so I think that surfacing this idea that people have self-doubt, and that's really common, and really it's just Part of life is a good thing to make clear. So let me tell you the story of getting from 10% to 40%. We're actually at 44% uh, now in the computer science degree at MUD. So just to give you a sense of female students at MUD overall, I've already talked a little bit about this. We were 22%. Well, actually, I, I should back up and I should say, um, at the time that MUD was founded, which was 1955, there was a disagreement between some members of the board and the founding president, Joe Platt, who died last August at the almost age of almost 97 and was a, just a phenomenal person. And in fact, I credit the vast majority of the amazing institution that MUD is, is due to Joe's vision and what he, how he led it for the first 20 years. Anyway, some of the board members wanted it, uh, MUD to be a men's institution. And, you know, at the time, uh, there was a co-ed institution, Pomona College. There was a women's institution, Scripps College. And there was um, a men's institution, Claremont Mechanic, then Claremont Men's College. And um, one of the board members said something like, who would ever want to marry a female mathematician? And Joe Platt said, I did. And he had. And was still married to her. And was still married to her when he died. Um, 
And so the compromise was there was a cap put on the, on the percentage of students that could be female. It was 11%. Now, I mean, 11%? <laughs> Where do you come up with a number like that? But in any case, by the time 1997 came along, so more than 40 years after the founding, it was up to about 22%. And by the time I arrived, it was up to about 32%. And uh, we were about 42% in 2010. And uh, at the beginning of this year, we're up to about 45%. Um, and the entering class this year was 48% female. I think it will be between 47% and 48% female this year, too. OK, so we're, we're making real progress. I mean, it's, it's good. However, something that's actually much more impressive is the percentage of our faculty that are female. So just to give you a sense, the percentage of female faculty in engineering school at MIT is 17. It's about like that at Princeton. It's about, I think it's 15% at engineering school at Stanford. Um, and we were about 20% in 1997. And we were up to about a third by 2006. And we're at 40%, and possibly even slightly higher than 40% now. And if I looked at, we had five people who were hired in 2011, five people who got tenure in 2011, and four out of five in both cases were female. So let me talk about what the computer science department did to increase the number of females majoring in computer science. They changed the introductory course. They eliminated something I'll call student macho behavior. They took every first year female who wanted to, to attend the Hopper course. And they provided summer research experiences for four years for about 10, while well, we had a grant for this, for about 10 females between first and second year. So I will talk in a moment a bit more about the, the intro course. But let me talk about student macho behavior. So one of the things that happens, um, in elementary school and high school these days is that there's not a lot of teachers who have a lot of experience with computer science. And the biggest reason for that is the job market. That, I mean, just the opportunities for people who get, have degrees in computer science is, ha, has been, uh, with, with a slight fall off in 2002 that had been recovered by 2004, has been really incredible for the last 20 years. So, so most, Teachers don't have a lot of experience in computer science. And there's a certain percentage of students who enter college who have been passionate about programming and computers from a very early age. Like that early age could be eight or three or 12, but they're largely self-taught and they are largely male. And they enter college and oh my goodness, they're in a computer science course and there's a faculty member who's a real computer scientist. And they just can't stop talking about how much they love all these things and what they know about computer science. Some of you might have been in a computer science course and had this experience. Anyone here had this experience? A few. OK. Well, of course, what happens to the other students is that they find it incredibly intimidating. Because they're sort of going like, I don't know all that stuff. I shouldn't be in this course because they assume that lots of other people know all that stuff too. So what, um, one of the things that we found incredibly effective is for the instructor to have a private conversation with students who are doing this outside of the classroom and just say something like, Joe, I love having you in my class. You're, I, it's wonderful to have someone with so much passion and so much background and interest and you know so much. You're really well prepared for this course. I'm sure you don't understand that a lot of the other students in the course find it intimidating when you talk about these things. So if we could just have these conversations in private, just the two of us. And virtually always, that student says, oh, I had no idea. And I will tell you, I've, I've talked about this at many computer science departments. And virtually always, some faculty member comes up and says, that was me. I had no idea I was doing that. And it's pretty much always a male. 
So changing the intro course. Well, one of the things about the intro course is that every single student at Harvey Mudd College has to take a computer science course in their first semester. They also have to take a physics course, a math course, a chemistry course, a humanities course. I mean, so there's a lot of courses they have to take. But the old course was learning to program in Java, which is pretty common. I mean, it was introducing, you know, real computer science concepts, but the way it was contextualized for the students was, the way they thought of it was they were learning to program in Java. And it was the most despised required course, <laughs> except by those students who had been waiting to take a real computer science course since they were a tender age. They changed it to computational approaches to problem solving using Python. Okay, so let me parse this into the parts that are important. So first of all, I'll just say that Python has two advantages. One is that it's a much more forgiving language than Java. But the other reason that it's good is it's actually used in the real world. Like there are lots of other introductory languages like Alice or Scratch, um, but they're not, I mean, and so they're more forgiving and maybe more motivating to learn to program in than Java, but you can't actually get, for the most part, a summer job programming in Scratch or Alice. Whereas you can really get a summer job programming Python. Um, it tends to be the most common prototyping language um, that's used today in finance and in software development and so on. Okay, now let's look at computational approaches to problem solving. So first of all, um, most people like problem solving. They like jigsaw puzzles and they like Sudoku and they like solving problems. And so this is really not about programming at all. It's about a particular approach to problem solving. And what they do in this course is that they make those problems incredibly fun. And I mean, so some of them are about, uh, you know, stopping the spread of a disease somewhere, saving lives. Some of them are about robots who love eating green spam for some reason and they have to find the green spam. I mean, there's a wide variety, but one thing they do is for almost every assignment, they give students a choice of which of two or three assignments and they only have to pick one. Because you're giving students the sense that they're actually choosing what they want to work on. And that turns, to, turns out to really help motivation. And also, a lot of the work in this class is team-based. Now, they actually do more programming, more coding in the new course than the old course. But they think it is the most fun course they've ever had. It went in one year with this change from the most despised course to the most loved course in the first semester. They also decided to group um, students into sections by prior experience. So our colors are black and gold and white. And so they have two sections, CS5 gold and CS5 black. Okay, which color would you like to be in? Gold, see I'd wanna be in gold. That's the one with no prior experience. Black is the one with prior experience. Um, they had some students who were just too advanced to do CS5 at all. So um, the next course would have been CS60, but the problem about putting those kids into CS60 is that we would have a bunch of students who had come through CS5 and would be still a little intimidated perhaps if we had those students going in there. So we give them their own section, it's called CS42. Those of you who've read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy understand, or the universe understand 42. Um, and this meant that we got macho behavior eliminated in both CS5 and it continued to be eliminated in CS60 and it just went away. The outcomes, everybody loves it. We have tripled the number of majors in computer science over the last six years. Uh, but we also have more non-majors taking higher level CS classes. The, I, you know, MUD students are required to take three semesters of math but only one semester of computer science. Most non-majors are now taking three semesters of computer science. So just something more about getting those women 
to think about majoring in computer science. They take CS5, they absolutely <laughs> love it, everybody loves it. That doesn't make them want to major in computer science. Because that was just a weird course. That, but they do take CS60 because that was, they had a lot of fun, so you could take the next course. And they like that one too. And then they take CS70. And by that point, and, and for all of those classes, they're, they're so close to 50-50 women that nobody bothers to count. And so there's no feeling of not belonging because it's full of women and men. By the time they've done CS70, they're sort of going like, oh, I guess I could be a CS major. They're great jobs. And, you know, I can still take biology and chemistry and fine arts and dance and be a CS major. So it's had a huge impact on, on everything. One of the things we hear from our faculty, not just in computer science, but from other departments is how the culture of MUD has changed with having so many female students. Now, you know, it's hard to say the culture has changed just because of the female students because so many other things have changed at the same time. But I will tell you that when I arrived in 2006, at graduation, more than half of the students, when asked if they would do MUD over again, I mean, if they would have chosen MUD if they had the decision to do over, more than half of the students said no. They said, it's just too hard. Now, a lot of those students a few years after would you know, see the value of their education. But at the time, they were feeling burnt out. I do an informal survey of, of graduating seniors at commencement weekend, given how small the number is and how much time we spend together doing things over commencement weekend. I'm able to talk to virtually every s senior. And uh, I ask them each year, would, if you had to do over again, would you pick mud again? Last year, over 90% said something on the order of in a heartbeat. And a story from Jerry Van Hecke for the mutters in the audience. Um, he said to me last year, he said, um, so he's class of 61, so first major graduating class. He's a chemistry professor. And he said, I just can't believe how great it is having so many female students here. He said, it's totally changed the experience of teaching. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, in my PCAM lab, I suddenly noticed that the students would arrive all wearing the same color. It'd be green one day, and then pink, and then purple. And then one day, they all came in ballroom attire to PCAM lab. And he said, I asked the students what was, had happened, and they said, oh, the girls decided to organize this. <laughs> we all thought it was fun. <laughs> so um, I be delighted to hear comments or answer questions and um, seeing this is being videotaped. Uh, we have a mic, so wait for the mic um, if you have a question or a comment. A little detail, I was interested in the size of your different sections of the computer science course, the Python course. Uh, yes, very good question. Well, our sections, um, you know, they, they typically run at about 60 to 70 in the first year courses. Individual sections, yeah. However, by the time, and, and that's because our incoming class is just under 200, and, and seeing, you know, they're divided into um, more than one. Um, well, actually, three sections. We actually now have CS5 Green, which is CS5 with all of the applications being out of biology motivated. Um, and CS40 usually, 42 usually runs around 40 students, so. But the interesting thing is that CS70, it really only used to be taken by CS majors and there weren't that many of them. And so it would run between a dozen and 20 per year. Last semester, actually this semester, we have 120 students in CS70. And um, it's not just that we have so many majors and so many non-majors wanting to take it. It's that the students from the other Claremont colleges have discovered the importance of learning computer science. And so they are flooding into our um, institutions. So 
um, it, for a place that prides itself on small classes, it's a bit of an issue. And you know, one of the things is that it's very hard to respond instantly to the increase in demand um, because you can't just take a physics professor or an engineering professor or a chemistry professor and say, oh, you're now a CS professor. So um, we have some issues about addressing that, but. Um, Great talk, thank you. Um, I had a question about, in talking with other deans and heads of universities, do you find them receptive to the changes you've made at Harvey Mudd, or like something they'd be interested in implementing at their own colleges and universities? Uh, great question, thank you. Um, it depends who you're talking to. Um, one of the things that, uh, so for example, um, Stanford is now actually really trying to address this, and, and it's something that I would say the dean cares about, the uh, chair of the CS department cares about, and they, I mean, they, it's very interesting because they have managed to get virtually every student at Stanford to take a computer science class, but the problem is that many of the women don't take it till their senior year. And then they discovered they love it because they've actually done a very good job with their intro course. So one of the things they're working on quite hard is to get more of, to get more women to take the intro CS class early on. And they they were about 10% female um, probably three years ago, and they're up to 17% uh, in in their graduating class this year female. So that's that's progress. MIT has been working on it really seriously as well, and they've. They're up at just over 30% female in the CS major. Um, Carnegie Mellon, I mentioned, and they're about 30% in the CS major, and that's been a priority for them, one that they've worked on significantly. On the other hand, you, you, know, you will see uh, other institutions that are 12% female and who, you know, either because they're feeling really stressed, I mean, a lot of state, a lot of public universities are under a lot of uh, budget pressure and they're just feeling it's very hard uh, to do things about this. Um, so I would say it's mixed, but one of the things I'm very excited about, so the, um, the person who really, uh, to a large extent, championed what happened at MUD, it wasn't me, it was our computer science faculty, but was a young uh, computer science faculty member, Christine Alvarado, who arrived one year before I arrived. And Christine had done her undergraduate at Dartmouth, had had a very supportive environment, and then went to do her PhD at MIT and in the area of artificial intelligence. And there are some areas of computer science at MIT that are known to be somewhat hostile and to women, and she had several students and faculty say to her, you only got in because you were female. Now, I mean, Christine is spectacular. She won a career award from NSF in her first year at or second year at Harvey Mudd College. Um, I mean, so it's just spectacular in all respects. She's gonna be a college president, I have no doubt. And, and she wants to be eventually, even. But um, she arrived and she saw this, I mean, the, her experience at MIT really bothered her and it was the first time she really felt, she really suffered from the imposter syndrome. Because it's very hard when people are saying to your face, you don't belong here, you're not good enough. And, and so she, um, when she saw the situation at MUD with 10% of this, the CS majors being female, she decided to do something about it. So she was the catalyst. Uh, several other faculty members worked with her on changing the intro class, but she was the person who you know, started talking about taking female students to Hopper. Um, she took 12 in 2006. Um, last year, we took um, 51. <laughs> Uh, plus another eight uh, more senior female students as mentors, plus three faculty to Hopper. I, I mean, we're this tiny college, and we had the largest academic presence at Hopper for the last two years. I'm sure we will again this year in Minneapolis. So the reason I'm, I was telling you about Christine, apart from the fact that I should tell you about Christine, is she just left us for uh, UCSD, the University of California, San Diego. And she left us because her, um, her husband, Alex, has a faculty position there. They were living sort of in between. She had her uh, second child um, six months ago, 
And it was just having two kids, it was just too hard to do this commute. And UCSD made her an offer, and we would have gladly made Alex an offer, but Alex is really into research and needs PhD students, and we just couldn't persuade him to move. So we lost Christine, which is awful, but it's also sort of wonderful, because she's gonna transform the program at UCSD. And you know, I think my experience is that every single institution that wants to increase the participation of women, whether it's in engineering or in physics or in computer science, they've been successful. It, it doesn't happen overnight. If you stop paying attention to it, it goes away. I mean, it, similarly, I'll just say for students who want to, I mean for students, for institutions who want to increase the participation of African Americans and uh, Native Americans and Hispanic students, if you persist, eventually you make progress. So I just want to talk very briefly about African American students at MUD. This has been one of my biggest frustrations because we have worked really hard on it and we have been running for a number of years at, in our incoming class, 196 students, two African American students. Then this last year, we got up to four. And I just got the data from our, it's not quite complete yet, but we have at least nine African American or partially African American students in our incoming class this year, which is an all time high for the college. And we have 22 Hispanic students, which is like last year we had 13. So I, you know, it's, it's one of these things. Persistence, persistence, persistence. Um, I, so my experience is that, yes, not every university is as passionate about it as we are. And I will say it takes everyone. I mean, why did the number of underrepresented groups in our incoming class go up this year? A group of roughly 15 of our faculty decided that they would contact every single student who identified as not white or Asian and either phone them or email them and personally encourage them to come. And it, it has close to doubled the number of those students who are showing up this in our incoming class. So. You mentioned how difficult it can be for women in graduate school. I, I was at Duke for graduate school when Nan Cohen started the Women's Initiative. And it was striking the drop off in confidence for both men and women soon after they entered graduate school. But it, it, it was interesting that the, that drop in confidence was so much greater for women. And then that, that the confidence levels r would rise again as they neared graduation. But it never quite, it didn't rise as quickly for women, and it never quite reached that confidence level they had when they came in. And this is an issue, obviously, if people aren't feeling confident, and so many are feeling that imposter syndrome, they're not as willing to take the next step in academics, they're, they're more likely to leave. Do you have ideas for how to improve the situation for graduate school? Well, I, the first thing I want to mention is there's a, a book that Sheryl Sandberg uh, published recently called Lean In. And it's, um, and... Uh, you know, I, I want to confess bias. I, not only am I I'm a friend of Cheryl's and, and proud to count her as a friend, but she has been extraordinarily, um, she's uh, resulted in us getting a lot of uh, attention about what we have done at Harvey Mudd College because she's a much more visible person than uh, anyone at Harvey Mudd is. So I, the first thing I want to do is um, I really recommend that book in terms of the, how important it is for us to encourage everyone, but especially underrepresented groups, to be ambitious about their career. And I think one of the most important things is to create networks of groups that support, of, of people that support each other. And, you know, I will tell you that, I mean, one of the things I, I do is I do, I, I mentor all kinds of people by phone. Um, like. I probably, I have no idea how many people I mentor a year, but you know, there's probably about 50 people in the world who will send me emails occasionally and say, uh, do you have time to do a phone call? I need some advice. And, uh, and it's everything from high school students through some of the most senior people in the field. And I, I do it for all kinds of reasons. One is I learn a tremendous amount from it. But the other reason I do it is um, because I've been very fortunate to have people do that for me in my life. 
But the biggest reason I do it is what I'm expecting is the vast majority of those people will do it for others. And, you know, I think this whole issue about confidence, I, I don't know how many times I've doubted I can do something and have had somebody who's close to me say, no, you can do that. You really can do that. Or, you know, you're doing such an awesome job at something or other. I mean, I, I will tell you, it's, it's really funny. When you're president of an institution, mostly you hear criticism. I, I think it's true for CEOs, too. But, I mean, it's just true that, you know, that's mostly what you hear because, I, because you're the person responsible for every single thing that goes wrong. And you are responsible for every single thing that goes wrong. So it's not surprising that that's what happens. But I, it's, uh, I think having a, a network of people whom you can reach out to and, and whom you will support yourself, I, I think really goes a long way. And it's one of the things that Cheryl talks about in, in her book. So, you know, um, I have a number of my undergraduate students from both the University of British Columbia and from Princeton and now from Harvey Mudd College who go to graduate school. And, and I will get, you know, emails saying, can I do a phone call? I'm about to give my first paper at a conference or I'm worried that I have to write my first grant and I don't think I'm going to do it well. Or, you know, I'm looking for my first job with my spouse and we have to negotiate these things together. And, you know, I, I think it's really helpful having those kinds of networks of people in your life. And the only way you get them is by... Um, I, you know, I mean, one of the things Cheryl says that I don't entirely agree with is that, you know, you should never walk up to a stranger and ask them to be your mentor. Well, people actually do it to me all the time. <laughs> and, and, and I pretty much always say yes. Now, I have an ulterior motive for saying yes, and that's that I love to paint. And I do most of this stuff on the phone on the weekend while I'm painting. And it allows me to feel really good about my painting because I'm doing something valuable in the world while I'm painting. And um, I'm beginning to believe that my painting is valuable in its own right, but it took me a long time to get there. And um, so, you know, like doing these phone calls, it's, I love talking to people while I paint, so it, it works out really well. So I think putting in place ways for students to learn to support each other. I mean, one of the things we did at Princeton was we started doing a lot of graduate student undergraduate joint activities because it turns out the undergraduates had so much more confidence ridiculously than the graduate <laughs> students but i mean it was just part of this part of the princeton culture that the undergraduates think that they're incredibly smart and then the graduate students feel quite challenged in their confidence levels and but getting mixing them together was actually really good for both groups so you know you need to look at each particular institution, UBC has a tri-mentoring program where they partner alumni, graduate students, and undergraduate students together. And, um, and, and you know, this whole idea of ladder mentoring is, is, is very, you know, works really well as well. I should also mention we did something called Wits On, Women in Tech Share Online in the fall semester, and um, had roughly a few thousand undergraduate women in science and engineering and several hundred, 600 mentors, everyone from graduate school through very senior positions in an online sort of forum. And I think actually the graduate students probably got the most out of it because even though they're officially there as mentors, there are all these other people who were a little bit ahead of them or a lot ahead of them and uh, it ended up being a very interesting conversation. So providing those kinds of venues where people can share information, share stories in particular, is really useful. Um, thanks so much for your talk. Um, I'm from World Learning, and we're trying to establish STEM model schools in Egypt, and we're having problems with the pipeline. A, a little bit about what you were talking about uh, with underrepresented groups not being either having access or the opportunity to come into STEM fields. Can you talk a little bit about what MUD has done to either the faculty or the students to reach out to those underrepresented groups, either at the high school or the middle school level? Great. So, um, so we've done a bunch of things. Um, one of them is um, our admissions folks have 
uh, organized something called the FAST program, which is Future Achievers in Science and Technology. And we fly out, uh, we do two of them in the fall and one of them in the spring. In the fall, we fly out people who would be admissible to MUD, so they have the kinds of academic records um, that we could admit them. And um, we bring them out for a couple of days, uh, all expenses paid. Um, we have them, they room with current students, they attend classes, they learn about financial aid and those kinds of things. Um, that's, been, that's been really helpful um, in, in terms of just getting the MUD experience on their horizon because, you know, we're just not well enough known in many parts of the country. Um, in the spring we do one, but that one, so that we bring seniors in the fall. Um, in the spring we do one for juniors, and that one we do for the local, you know, Southern California region. And it's much more, we don't, you know, try to filter for students who would be admitted to MUD. I mean, we're, uh, I mean, our, our the GPA and, and SATs are equivalent to Caltech or MIT, so they're extremely high um, in terms of admission, but we do it for everyone in the surrounding area. We also do um, an annual West Conference, which is uh, women, enge women engineers, scientists, and technologists. Um, and it's run by uh, our female students, and we bring roughly between 250 and 300 uh, female students, roughly 10th uh, and 11th grade, um, for, and do a lot of hands-on activities with them. We have Upward Bound, an Upward Bound program that's been at MUD for, I think it's 42 years, something like that. And um, it's, you know, we typically get one or two students uh, from Upward Bound uh, who apply to MUD and come to MUD each year. If, if, you know, but it's again, we're trying to, it's a program that I think is really helpful. They're all students from low income, uh, neighborhoods and low-income homes, they're virtually all students of color, and we're really helping them. Uh, it's a, a year-long program with an intensive summer program as well, and I think it's, it really, uh, they have something like 96% of their students are going on to four-year colleges, and they're pretty much all from homes where nobody's ever gone to college, so I think it's, it's, it, it's part of really moving, reaching out and moving that group. We tried doing, um, uh, a math camp for African-American boys for a couple of years. It turned out not to work well um, because it turned out that the way the kids were selected, which we weren't in charge of, we ended up with a lot of African-American boys who didn't like math and had severe behavior problems. So um, we hope to restart that one, but um, yeah. use a different selection process. There's a, obviously a long story behind that one. We're looking at doing an engineering girls camp uh, for probably girls at the end of ninth grade and girls of color, and we've got a proposal in. We hope we'll be funded for that. We'll probably start not this summer, but the next one after that. We are doing two high school AP courses as MOOCs, um, Masses of Open Online Courses. Though we one for physics, AP Physics C, which is mechanics with calculus, and one for uh, principles of computer science. We hope. Um, I mean, it will definitely be a, a CS course. I, the problem is the principle com of computer science isn't entirely defined yet. It's not actually the exam. It's not offered yet. But um, we're going to have the people who are doing the presentations be largely our students. And we'll be able to have students of color and females and all kinds of things so that we'll be showcasing uh, a much more diverse, but also a younger group of people who should be good role mo models for the students who see them. Um, we hope to actually teach the uh, CS class in a school where that is almost all students of color and be able to, I mean, this will depend on getting permission from their parents, of course, but be able to film some of those students so that, again, we have role models uh, for underrepresented groups where they can see students of their own age. Um, we do science bus, which is a science, uh, or something that our students take a bus out with all kinds of hands-on science things into the surrounding neighborhoods, schools. Uh, we do hom homework hotline. We actually do a lot for such a tiny place, which is um, a free uh, tutoring by, um, by phone to um, students in the surrounding schools. Um, 
uh, for uh, math and science homework from fourth through twelfth grade, and we have roughly about forty of our, our students, mostly first years, doing that, um, which we think is really good for them because it sort of gives them a sense of value that they can help somebody else when they're going through all this challenge. Um, and we do the professional development of Math for America in Los Angeles, which is uh, by we, it's really Daryl Young, for those of you who know Daryl, an amazing uh, math professor and, and also mud alum. Um, and um, that's putting, uh, you know, really excellent math teachers in uh, a number of the schools, in particular in LAUSD. And of course, most of the students in most of those schools are students of color. And so, yeah, we, and I probably missed some things, but um, our whole idea is we work very hard to try and be this amazing science and engineering and math education that also has a very substantial component of humanities, social sciences, and the arts that has this very big focus on collaboration, on helping each other. There's no competition for grades. And we really try to have our students focus on how they can make the world a better place, how they can use this amazing education they get to really make a difference. And, and I think that that sort of shows up in the kinds of things, not just that our students do, but our faculty try to do to really, you know, m move science and engineering and math education forward in the world. Uh, we have somebody there. Sorry. I'd argue that the largest unrepresented group is uh, STEM applicants nationally. And uh, a lot of it has go goes back to your comments about gatekeepers. Particularly among engineers, I think you'll find a lot of engineer applicants come from people who had one in the family, an uncle, a cousin, or maybe a high school teacher was an engineer, which is hard to find nowadays. Uh, there's been several bills before Congress that have both, I think twice they've been there and defeated, where they've encouraged or would require universities to publish uh, average salaries within 12 months of graduation, 24 months of graduation by degree, and percentage of employment within 12 months after graduation. The kind of information you get from an uncle or a father who's an engineer or whatever that you can't if you're an underprivileged kid or, or with nobody like that in high school as a counselor. Why do you think the, in the academic community is very much against these two bills? Uh, why, they don't want to pit literature against engineering, but I would think that's the kind of facts that you need for the, to, you know, so, so some kid in uh, Southeast DC high school has nobody in the family, nobody in the faculty that could advise, and an elite school like yours wouldn't be reaching out to them and you're, you're a small part of the university. Don't you think a, a bill like that would actually help with recruitment for STEM nationally and then through that underprivileged folks? So first of all, I'm probably the wrong person to ask this question because I do think a bill like that would probably help underprivileged students get a sense of what they ought to do. Now the reason, um, the reason I'm not the right person is because uh, even though, uh, though I'm now an American citizen, I grew up in Canada and spent you know much of my life in Canada. In Canada, we actually believe that uh, there should be a strong correlation between what happens in university and what you end up doing with your life afterwards. And so, for example, we have virtually every university has co-op programs where you can take five years and graduate instead of with a debt with actually a bank account. Um, because you're going to work uh, 20 months out of those five years and you're going to work in areas related to what you're actually studying. And I was sort of stunned when I came to Princeton and um, our first year, our, our student economic, uh, student engineering society had done a survey of the first year engineering students and they had asked them why they had picked engineering to major in. And something like 70 or 80 percent said that it was because they wanted a, a good career afterwards. And when I showed this to the president and the provost and the dean of the faculty and a few other people, they were horrified. It, it was sort of like, 
don't you feel awful, Maria, that they're studying engineering because they want to work as an engineer? <laughs> I'm going like, no. <laughs> so there, there is this belief in the United States that it's somehow wrong to want an education for it to help you with your career after that. And I do think that that is one of the misalignments with a number of underrepresented groups because I mean, we just, we know from research that if, if you want to persuade, uh, if you want to persuade some of, the, you know, particularly African Americans and, and Hispanic students in high school that they really need a university education, the best, the most effective thing to persuade them and their parents is to show that it will lead to a successful career. So, um, I mean, I, I can understand why many institutions, I mean, I do think that publishing that data will cause changes in choices of major, and I think that there are a lot of universities that would be, be very upset about that. Thanks. Uh, you focused your efforts on one department, computer sciences. Uh, just very briefly, what effect has that had on other departments, and have they adapted similar types of, um, should, so we say, competitive uh, changing courses to attract students? I, great question. And I guess the first thing I could should say is that at the time that this effort started, and, and, and I'll say it's not my focus, it was that the computer science department happened to do it, and partly because I'm a computer scientist, partly because I have worked on this at other institutions when I was the chair of computer science or whatever, um, I've gotten way too much credit for it. But um, the first thing I should say is that the time when the computer science department started this, a third of the students in uh, at MUD were female, and they were really by far the most underrepresented for female. So for instance, about 30% of the engineering majors were female. Physics was about 22%. Math was probably, you know, more like 35%. Chemistry and, and biology were probably close to 50%. You know, so, I mean, the, the result, there was one clear department that was really out of line with everybody else. As the numbers have gone up uh, for the college as a whole, I would say that um, you, we're seeing, a, you know, if you look at math, computer science, engineering, uh, biology, and chemistry, you, you see good numbers of women in all of them. I mean, so, you know, you're not, the, the one department that I would say is still uh, somewhat upper, un, underrepresented is probably physics, which is maybe 25% female. Um, that's, they're still probably higher than the nation, uh, which is more like 20% female. And, but um, I am noticing so that they suddenly have a big increase in the number of physics majors and um, in, in the sophomore year is when they pick. And um, I'm, I'm noticing that um, they, there's a good number of women in those physics majors and they have changed who's teaching the intro courses and I think there is some of that going on. So I, I suspect that physics is going to be right where everybody else is very soon. <laughs>